Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Annette Stanton, and I have the honor of chairing the Department of Psychology at UCLA. It's my great pleasure to introduce the three psychology faculty who will be speaking with us this evening. My esteemed colleagues will share their latest findings in neuroscience, followed by a discussion during which you can submit your questions. Uh, you can submit your questions anytime at the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We, you know, you'll notice that the chat is turned off and that we are recording the session. Now, of course, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the department. As many of you know, we're a leading department of psychological science and education. We have foremost experts in psychology and neuroscience who conduct innovative and impactful research in behavioral neuroscience, clinical, cognitive, developmental, health, quantitative, and social psychology. More than 4,000 undergraduates are enrolled in our three psychology majors, and I know we're speaking to many of you who are alums, psychology alums. Our highly competitive PhD program, with its 211 PhD students, supports tomorrow's leaders in research, teaching, and public service. We also serve the community. In addition to translating our research into action to enhance the public's health, UCLA Psychology operates a psychology clinic that provides low fee therapy and assessment services to adults, children, couples, and families. And we have an infant development program that provides evidence supported high quality childcare to infants and toddlers, a faculty, staff, and students. Truly, one of my favorite activities as chair of the department is highlighting the exciting research and education conducted by our psychology faculty, along with graduate students and undergraduates and postdoctoral scholars. Today, we're all here for the sixth event in our Psychology Prevents Presents series, the neuroscience of cravings, consciousness, and cross-ideological conversations with a little bit of alliteration thrown in. Um, our hope is that today's event is enlightening for you and also sparks conversation and action. Now let me introduce our first professor to speak with us this evening, Professor Laura Ray. After earning the PhD at the University of Colorado Boulder and completing postdoctoral research at Brown University Medical School, Dr. Ray joined our faculty in 2008. Among her many awards, are the prestigious American Psychological Association's Award for Distinguished Early Con Career Contributions to Psychology, and our department's awards both for teaching and for graduate student mentoring. Professor Ray was recently elected as president of the Research Society on Alcoholism. She's a licensed clinical psychologist who also works in UCLA's addiction psychiatry clinic. As you'll see, her lab's very active research program addresses the clinical neuroscience of addiction as integrated with experimental psychopathology, behavioral genetics, and psychopharmacology. Welcome, Dr. Ray. There you are, take it away. Thank you so much, Dr. Stanton, and hello to everyone, all the Bruins out there. It's really a pleasure to join you this evening. Thanks for making time for us. Um, what I want to do is I'm going to start by sharing my screen with you and going over um, going over what I hope will be some exciting um, data. So let me start here. And okay. So as Dr. Stanton mentioned, I am a clinical psychologist by training. And I'm very interested in the treatment of addiction. We know that one of the many things we're dealing with as a country is an opioid epidemic. Um, most of us would say it's really an addiction epidemic because we have a twin epidemics of stimulants, alcohol, and opioids. And what I want to share with you is a window into how we study and how we hope to improve care for individuals with a substance use disorder. I'm going to focus today on alcohol. As Dr. Stanton mentioned, I'm very involved in alcohol research and I'm excited to lead the Research Society on Alcoholism. So uh, with that, 
Let me tell you what I want to cover today. I want to start with this idea of what are alcohol cravings? How do we experience that? How do patients experience that? And importantly, moving to the brain, how does the brain really map on a signature of cravings? Is that useful for us? Can we target those cravings as a, a treatment option and, and really a way to ultimately reduce drinking? So from having the cravings to understanding the signature in the brain to targeting cravings and ultimately improving lives through uh, reductions in drinking and promoting heavy, uh, healthier drinking styles is what we wanna cover today. So before we get to um, the idea of you know, how we intervene, I want to do a quick exercise with you where we do kind of a word cloud together. And for that word cloud, what we wanna do is kind of think for a minute about what are cravings. I want you to, um, if you will, join me here for a moment. I'm gonna stop sharing this and I'm gonna share a, a window right here where you can enter your answers. So we're all very familiar with our phone and I'm gonna ask you to pick up your phone for a moment. Um, here we go. Um, now I'm sharing this window with you. And if you go to www.menti.com, you can enter this uh, code number, which is 89852089. And that should prompt you to see the question, which is what comes to mind when you think of the word craving? So it's a one word answer, you know, what, what comes to your mind when you think of the word craving? If you have an opportunity to participate, I would really um, be delighted. Yeah, here we go. We're seeing need, desire, food, addiction, absolutely. Hunger, a sense of desperation. Very nice. Thank you for participating. Thinking of something irresistible, perhaps. Thinking of a drug. Absolutely. Yeah, lonely. I'm, I'm glad someone brought that up. The idea of that maybe when you are lonely, there's a, a, you're more likely to experience a craving. So really great. Um, you know, some of you are thinking about sugar, chocolate, you know, lots of things can trigger cravings. That's a great um, that's a great response there, but really drugs are critical, right? And I think uh, one of the words here is um, pain and suffering, right? This is really important to the clinical presentation of cravings and addiction. And the other one is uncontrollable. That's another thing that I hear a lot from, from my patients. So thank you so much for participating in this brief exercise. I'm going to stop sharing and I'll go back to um, my original slide. I really appreciate you playing along with this. So what my patients really tell me often is that they experience cravings as kind of a state of deprivation. They experience that, you know, really they need the alcohol or the drug as much as they need food and water for survival, right? So exactly the kinds of ideas, the desperation, the intensity that you're describing uh, in response to this prompt, right? So how do we get from that construct um, and those words into something biological and a biomarker? How do we go into the brain to identify a signature of craving? Well, as you probably imagine, we take advantage of uh, fMRI technology, functional um, neuroimaging, or um, the idea that we can use um, signal, we can use uh, identify signal and activity in the brain, especially while the brain is doing something. So what do you think I would most likely be doing to elicit cravings, right? So some of you talked about foods. If I were eliciting food cravings, I'll probably present images of really delicious foods. I might ask someone to not eat lunch so they're especially hungry, right? Uh, that might be a good way to elicit food cravings. For alcohol, what we do is we compare um, two types of uh, stimuli. We look at um, alcohol stimuli, like you see the cold beer, and we compare it to a neutral stimuli, like a cold water. When we take out the difference, so we really 
our focus on what's the unique brain response to alcohol, not just to a cold beverage. And what we get when we do that is a lot of activation in what we call the subcortical regions of the brain, those regions that have been uh, preserved over, uh, over time because they're so important for survival. So, you know, our patients are telling us that they feel they need the drug for survival. And guess what? In their brains, the activation, the signal that we see is very much in that survival circuitry, the reward circuitry that tells us to do a behavior over and over, like have sex to reproduce, have food to survive, have water to survive, and so forth. So we see a lot of activation in the subcortical regions and also in the frontal cortex, which is involved in decision making. So we think about a lot of signaling, a lot of communication between the go signal in the brain, do something, and activity in the frontal cortex trying to decide, really, should I do this? So we know what craving feels like. We know what it looks like in the brain. One of the questions is, can we use that information to improve lives, right? And so how do we reduce cravings? This is Dr. Erica Grodin, who's a junior faculty working with me. And we've been working on the modulation on the neuroimmune signaling in the brain. So in other words, brain levels of inflammation may play a role in a lot of emotional problems, including problematic drinking, depression, and so forth. So we're testing a drug that reduces brain levels of inflammation, it's called ibutalast. And what we wanna see is, well, can we actually reduce the brain activation, the brain's response to craving stimuli, to alcohol stimuli? And what we find is that yes, we uh, can. If you look at ibutalast, and I'll try to use my laser pointer here. If we um, look at ibutalast, compared to placebo, you see a below baseline. We see a reduction in the activity, in the brain activity in the ventral striatum, uh, which is a good sign. We're saying that, you know, people are now less likely to show a brain response um, in the reward circuitry when they see the cold beer as compared to the cold water. But the question is, well, if I do all that, does it matter, right? Like, does it predict drinking? So Libby over here, one of our awesome PhD students, knows that we did a scan, we evaluated people's responses in the, in the scanner, and then we follow them over time. We see how much they're drinking after the scan. So the real question is, can we identify who's going to drink more or less based on what we've seen in the scanner? Very interesting to us, we find that people on the medication condition, the ones who drink less, were actually the ones with the low brain activation. So if they came to our laboratory and showed a lower activation, uh, in, in the brain's reward circuitry to alcohol, they went on to have an average of four drinks per drinking day. And the ones on the medication who didn't show that pattern of response, even though they were taking the same medication, were drinking more like seven or eight drinks uh, per drinking day. So again, it's really important for us to show a relationship between what we see in the brain and behavior. One of the ways that I would summarize this work briefly for you is that we're working with a treatment that reduces drinking. That's first and foremost. At the end of the day, we want to deliver, we want people um, to benefit from science in tangible ways. We know that this medication is working to reduce uh, brain levels of inflammation, and we've documented that it does reduce the activation to alcohol versus control cues. So that salience of the cold beer is reduced by this medication. But very important, the folks who show that signature of reduced brain um, activation or less brain-based cravings are the ones who are actually drinking less. So this is super exciting for us. And it's a way to really integrate neuroscience into an application and to improve uh, treatments. Briefly, I wanna show you a figure from Lindsay Meredith, another fabulous uh, graduate student. And she's really working all the way here from an alcohol use disorder to um, developing immune therapies, much like we have immune therapies for cancers and other um, medical conditions. And what we're trying to do is use craving over here as a critical symptom that we can study in the brain and in patients with substance use disorders. 
And finally, my last slide here is to tell you that we care deeply about improving the health care of those in our community. We have a low cost option, treatment option through our UCLA psychology clinic. I directly supervise the care of these patients that come and join us. So uh, if this is something that you know someone in your life or someone you know can benefit from, please feel free to share that information. Um, and then finally, I want to show you a, a slide over here of this amazing team of investigators. So proud of everyone uh, in our lab from our physicians who work with us prescribing these medications like Dr. Gillis and Dr. Miodo, to amazing um, doctoral students and also fantastic uh, undergraduates. We're very grateful to have such amazing uh, network of uh, collaborators and scientists at UCLA. So I'm gonna stop here and I wanna thank you for your time and for joining us. Thanks so much, Professor Ray. Your, your research is ground, ground baked breaking and, and we so appreciate that you're working not only to understand but also to improve treatments for addiction. Thank you so much. Um, now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Martin Monti. Dr. Monti is a professor in our cognitive area and behavioral neuroscience in the psychology department. Upon earning his PhD in psychology and neuroscience from Princeton and conducting postdoctoral research at the Medical Research Council in Cambridge, England, Dr. Monty joined our department in 2011. Among his honors are the department's Distinguished Teaching Award, the International Giuseppe Shaka Award for Medical Research, I hope I didn't butcher that pronunciation too much, um, and the Division of Life Sciences Faculty Award for Outstanding Research Publication. This evening, he'll be sharing his fascinating discoveries in consciousness and cognition in coma. Martin, take it away. Well, good evening. Thank you, Dr. Stanton. Good evening, um, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. It's a pleasure to share a little bit um, my work with you. Um, and um, before starting, the one thing I do want to uh, point out is that although I will gladly take all the credit for everything that I'm about to say, uh, I do want to point out that all of the work that we've done, and you've seen the same uh, from, the, from Dr. Ray's talk, is really done thanks to the wonderful talent that we're lucky enough to be able to attract here at UCLA. And it is mostly uh, uh, students who are pursuing their PhD or postdoctoral scholar. And I feel this, we couldn't have a better environment to ask complex questions such as those that, that we uh, are interested in answering. So what I'd like to do uh, tonight is really just uh, a couple, um, uh, I would like to, I would like to sh um, share with you uh, really two stories, two episodes that, that as an illustration, uh, as an example of the kind of things that we do in my laboratory. Now, the first story starts uh, circa 2013. I was an assistant professor here at UCLA. At that point, it was my third year as an assistant professor. Um, and somebody had found my work online and contacted me to see if I'd be willing to be flown all the way from here to Israel to do a specialized assessment of a patient who at the time I was told was in a disorder of consciousness. Now, this is what my laboratory specializes in, disorders of consciousness. Now, these are a set of conditions where patients survive, individuals survive some severe brain injury. Um, very often the cases with a car accident where there's a, a severe head impact or maybe a heart attack or a near drowning. Um, and after all the these individuals survive the severe brain injury, they never quite fully recover, recover a state of consciousness. And uh, the most familiar of these conditions um, is that of coma, which is an acute disorder of consciousness. Um, and see, at the time when I was contacted, um, there was a lot of discussion as to whether this patient, who, who later turned out to be the former, um, the late uh, former prime minister, Ariel Sharon, there was a lot of discussion as to whether he was uh, unconscious, which means he was in a vegetative state, another type of disorder of consciousness, or whether he was partially conscious or minimally conscious, which means if he was in a minimally conscious state, the third disorder of consciousness. Um, and see, this leads me to the first question. And let me ask you, 
how do you know? How do you tell the difference between somebody who's unconscious or somebody who's a little bit conscious? In fact, let me ask you, how do you even know that anyone other than yourself is conscious? See, I know I'm conscious, I, I feel it. I, I, I'm experiencing the world around me. I experience the, the sounds, the sights. If I were to ask every one of you, are you conscious? It would take you less than a heartbeat to say, of course I am. Because you have your own experience and you, and you, you have a feeling of having an experience, which is what we refer to as consciousness. Now, what is much, much harder is for you to point at me and say, Martin, I'm 100% sure that you're conscious just like me. And see, the issue is that you don't have access to my feeling, to my subjective feeling of being here, of experiencing what's happening to me, of experiencing the world. And so on the one hand, this is a very fascinating philosophical question, but more practically, for somebody who like me is interested in these disorders, how do we tell if a patient is conscious or not? And see, so what we often do is, and you're seeing an example here, we will go at the bedside of a patient and, and we'll ask them to reveal to us, are you conscious? For example, here you can see the clinician asking the patient, please follow this object with your eyes and, and you're the clinician, look at her eyes. Is she following this object? Very carefully, because you will have to determine if she's conscious or not. And now sometimes some patients can, can demonstrate this and we see that and we say, oh, this must mean that the person is conscious or this is minimally conscious. But let me give you this puzzle. What if somebody were conscious, a little bit, let's say, but could never, could not move because they had a severe brain injury and that prevents them from being able to, you know, to, to, to blink on command, to move and, and track an object with their eyes or to move a finger and move a foot and tell me, yes, I'm here, I, I hear you and I'm here. How would you ever be able to tell that such a person is conscious? And see, that's why they contacted me because what I was doing at the time is I was developing methods to look directly into somebody's brain and tell if someone is conscious or not. And, and in fact, let me do this small exercise with you. For just a moment, close your eyes. I can't enforce it, okay, but close your eyes. I'll trust you. And imagine you're playing tennis. Imagine you're on a tennis court and you're playing with someone and just imagine swinging your arm back and forth, forehand, backhand, smash. It doesn't matter if you don't know how to play tennis, just imagine. Okay, open your eyes. If I had put you inside an MRI machine while you were doing exactly this, I would see that certain parts of your brain become metabolically very active and, and become very responsive. See these little hot spots right here? These are parts of the brain that became, that became very active when I asked somebody to imagine playing tennis. And these are part of your motor system. It's, it's parts of your brain that are important to perform the motor actions and to sequence complex motor actions, just like imagining playing tennis. And see, so what we did in that case and in many other cases is, is we use these techniques so that if somebody can't blink or can't follow an object with their eyes, can't tell us that they're conscious that way, maybe they can think about something. And if I can see it, I can recognize it. And I can tell if they're conscious or not. In fact, if somebody, I could ask you, instead of imagining playing tennis, I could ask you to imagine being at the front door of your home and then open the door and, and imagine visiting all the rooms in your home and imagine seeing everything that you'd see. If you did that, a very different part of your brain would become engaged and interested and active. Now, if I can put somebody's brain in two different states and I can recognize them because they're different enough, then this opens up a whole avenue because if you can do two things, it's like having a language. It's like having a yes, no. If you want to say yes, imagine playing tennis. If you want to say no, imagine walking around the rooms of your home. And if you're clever enough, um, from the technical point of view, you can, actually, um, you can actually develop some computer software. As you can, you can see here, you can connect somebody's head to an, electro, an electroencephalography device. And a computer can recognize if you're imagining playing tennis and, and it, it will move the cursor up. Or if you imagine walking around the rooms of your home, it will, it will push the cursor down. And now if somebody can push a cursor up or down just by imagining something, then they can probably write an email with the strategy. They can turn on or off the, the lights of their home, et cetera, et cetera. So, so this 
is a way in which we've, we've tried to better understand how much brain function is possible at the lower boundaries of consciousness and on the way to do that, understand how can we better diagnose patients and understand these patients if they're conscious or not. But of course, what this doesn't answer is why. Why are some patients after a severe brain injury, why do they become able to recover consciousness and others don't? What's the difference between a brain that can be conscious and a brain that cannot? It turns out there's a very special part in the very middle of, of our brains. If I could, in fact, look at your brain, which you see here, and could make it transparent and look in the middle of it, I would find that there are two small nuclei shaped like eggs, known as the thalami, the left and the right thalamus. And these two parts of the brain are extremely important to maintain a state of consciousness. They're, they're very special parts of the brain because they receive information from the outside world. It, all the information gets funneled through these parts of the brain. They broadcast this information all over the rest of your brain. And then they receive information back from the rest of your brain. And they turn out to be very important. Now, this is where story two begins, because it turns out that in disorders of consciousness, uh, this part of the brain doesn't quite function as it should. And so the question is, can we intervene and can we stimulate this part of the brain and, and help the brain restart functioning better? And it turns out you can with surgery. You can put a, a lead, it's known as a deep brain stimulation lead. You can do a, a fairly invasive surgery, put the lead that goes all the way down to the thalamus, and it, 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 tr it tries to excite it and get it to work again. Unfortunately, this doesn't work very well because of the invasive surgeries in these patients. They're very hard to do because of the brain pathology. So I thought, well, is there another way? Is there some way that we can do this, but without surgery? And just about um, around the, the, the 2010, a new technology was being developed or maybe redeveloped, which is a new version of ultrasound. The ultrasound that you're all very familiar with. Uh, it turns out that you can use ultrasound to take pictures the way you're familiar with, but you can also use ultrasound to focus the ultrasound and to excite parts of the brain. So what I can, what I can do and what we do now is we take an ultrasound transducer, which is what you see here, just about the size of a, of a coffee cup a saucer. And without having to do any surgery, we, we, we can inject pressure waves inside the brain and we can excite the thalamus deep in the middle of the brain. So this allows us to do the exact same thing, but without surgery. And, and so patient number two came to this trial. We were bringing patients to UCLA. We would do this. Um, we would stimulate their thalamus, then bring them back a week later. Patient number two comes the first time. We do the intervention. One week later, they, they come back. And the wife comes to me. And the first thing she tells me is, I need more of this. And I ask her, what do you mean you need more of this? And she says, I had for the very first time a conversation with my husband since the accident, since, since the accident he had two years ago. It turns out she noticed that for the first time, her husband could fairly, after the first stimulation, could look up and down systematically on command. And so she would show him pictures and say names of people and, and ask if he'd recognize them. And he would look up to say yes and, and look down to say no. And she said, it's been two years. It's the first time I had a two-way interaction with my husband. And for you and me, this sounds like a small thing. But for these patients, being able to communicate again is extremely exciting because it gives them back some ability to interact with the world. And now that we've done this in a, in a group of patients, actually, there's some really good data to show. And I'll show you my last slide. Uh, this is a, a, a group um, data set. So this is where our patients are in terms of how impaired they are. See the scale? It's a scale of impairment. Low down means bad and high up means good. This is where our patients are before the ultrasound. After the ultrasound, patients on average tend to be better, tend to be more responsive. And of course, there isn't, you know, there are limits to what we can do, but it really looks like with this, we can help move patients towards being more able to express to express behavior and to interact with their environment. And this for us is extremely exciting because we can intervene on the brain and try to help patients be better, try to give them back a little bit of autonomy, a little bit of an ability to interact with their environment. And with this, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Professor Monty. I can just imagine the wife's uh, in extreme pleasure at being able to communicate with her husband. 
Uh, and I absolutely am convinced that you are conscious uh, in your work. Thank you. Um, next, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Matthew Lieberman, a professor in our social psychology area. While earning his PhD at Harvard, Dr. Lieberman and a colleague actually coined the term social cognitive neuroscience, now a thriving area of research that interrogates so social psychological questions using the methods of neuroscience. In 2007, Dr. Lieberman won the APA Distinguished Scientific Award for Early Career Contributions to Psychology. And in 2011, he won the UCLA Gold Shield Faculty Prize. His book, which I highly recommend, is entitled Social, Why Our Brains Are Wired to Be Social, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Dr. Lieberman's findings have received coverage in the New York Times, Time Magazine, Scientific American, ABC's Nightline, among others. I'm sure I've piqued your interest. So let's welcome Dr. Lieberman. All right, thank you, Annette. Um, it's great to be with all of you and uh, getting to share some of uh, what we've been up to in my lab. Um, so uh, I'm guessing uh, that uh, I don't really need to convince almost anyone in this audience that ideological polarization is a big problem in our society these days. Um, I've been coming at this issue of polarization from the perspective that opposing partisans, people on opposite ends of the political spectrum, literally see the world differently from one another. Now, when I say see, I don't just mean what hits the retina, Rather, I believe that we mean something similar by the word see when we say, um, I see a mountain. And when we say, I see that the baby wants that toy block where the wanting is clearly invisible. Um, and when we hear someone else talk about something and then say, uh, oh, I see what you mean, or uh, I see things differently. In uh, each of these different kinds of seeing, uh, there's something that's very similar in that these experiences are coherent, they're effortless, and they're conscious experiences, or what I call seeing with a C. Um, in each of these different kinds of seeing, we feel like we are objectively capturing reality as it is, and we don't recognize the special effects team working in the back of our minds to create that particular experience. And I've been focused on a part of the brain that I've been calling gestalt cortex, that combines inputs from the external world with internal inputs already floating around in our minds to create our personal experience of reality. Um, there's now lots of data suggesting that when two people watch um, a video clip and experience it similarly, uh, this region of the brain, gestalt cortex, will be more similar over time in how it responds than if the two people experience the clip very differently from one another. In other words, the amount of neural synchrony or synchronization in these brain regions is an indicator of when two people see and experience things similarly. Now, when it comes to polarization, we might expect less neural synchrony among people who aren't seeing eye to eye, like a liberal and a conservative. And this is what we call neural polarization. Uh, one important difference between my talk and most neuroimaging talks is that my data here was all collected using functional near-infrared spectroscopy, or FNIRS for short. There won't be a quiz on the full name. Uh, FNIRS relies on a very similar signal from the brain as fMRI, but it uses light absorption rather than the magnetic properties of blood to track blood flow in the brain. Um, in essence, FNIRS is like wearing a, a bunch of pulse oximeters on your head. And one of the advantages of FNIRS is that it is truly portable. So portable, in fact, that for three straight summers, we packed up uh, our uh, FNIRS equipment, put it in carry-on luggage, and flew to the Middle East, where we temporarily ran a pop-up neuroimaging lab in Amman, Jordan. And what we did there was look at ideological partisans and tried to see if we could tell their hidden ideological beliefs, uh, what they were just from their neural data alone. We looked at Iraqi expats, half of them were pro-life 
and half were pro-choice, although pro-choice means something pretty different in this part of the world. And uh, all of these folks then watched a pro-life video and a pro-choice video, both in Arabic. We then used machine learning to determine whether each participant's neural response was a closer match to the pro-life group or the pro-choice group. And this allowed us to accurately predict the participants' hidden ideological beliefs about abortion. And when our algorithm made the same classification for a person across both videos, the accuracy that we had was over 80%, which is really uh, quite high in this context. And this suggests that neural polarization is real and can be identified with this procedure. Now, the next thing we did was examine whether uh, an open-mindedness intervention could change the way people react to these kinds of polarizing videos. In this study done here in my lab at UCLA, we had a group of liberals watch a pro-gun video, the kind of video that would usually make um, a liberal, you know, make their blood boil. And uh, before they watched, half of our liberals received an intervention meant to temporarily make them more open-minded. Now we can imagine at least two different ways that open-mindedness might affect a liberal's response to this uh, pro-gun video. On the one hand, open-mindedness might change the way a person immediately sees and experiences that video content. On the other hand, when someone is being open-minded, they might experience the video the same way they always did, but then they might stop and think about that immediate response and maybe reappraise it after the fact deciding that they're being sort of too harsh or rash in their judgment. In terms of neural synchrony, if open-mindedness altered a person's thinking primarily, we would expect open and closed-minded folks to still have lots of neural synchrony with each other while watching the video because the effects of the open-mindedness would come later during the rethinking or reappraising process after watching the video. In contrast, if open-mindedness actually changes uh, the way we see and experience things, then we would expect open and closed-minded liberals to have reduced neural synchrony with each other while watching the video. And this is exactly what we found. It really was the seeing that seemed to be changing while they watched this video. Now, to be clear, uh, we don't think our intervention is changing liberals into Second Amendment uh, gun rights advocates, but we do think that it's changing the way they see the arguments and people from the other side, which is a critical step towards meaningful dialogue. And speaking of dialogue, we wanted to move beyond partisans watching ideological content to partisans talking about ideological content. Luckily, with FNIRs, we can do this. But this research is really hard to do for another reason. It requires a liberal and a conservative. And these days, there aren't that many conservatives at UCLA. And most of them don't feel comfortable airing their ideological views publicly. So for a first pass at what conflict during conversations looks like in the brain, uh, we moved to a group that we knew we could get to argue in the lab, romantic couples. So uh, we brought in these romantic couples and we had them have two conversations while we sort of took FNIR's recordings. First, they discussed a topic they disagreed on that they hadn't yet resolved. And then they were asked to discuss uh, what they like and appreciate about each other, a much more pleasant conversation. And what we were expecting to see was less neural synchrony, less synchronization between their two brains in Gestalt cortex, that region I'm interested in, during the conflict conversation, because conflict is literally associated with seeing things differently than one another. And the areas shown here in red indicate that this is exactly what happened. Now, we were uh, pre preparing to run a more ideologically focused FNIR study when COVID hit and shut everything down. And at this point, it occurred to us that we could run a version of the study we wanted to using this. Zoom. Um, no one has ever done face-to-face -face psychology over Zoom, but for us, it solved a huge problem, which is it allows us to bring together people of all political stripes from all over the country, rather than just focusing on recruiting from liberal LA. Um, so we had people have a conversation over Zoom with someone uh, who genuinely uh, strongly opposed their position on the topic they were going to talk about. These conversations produce plenty of conflict. 
The participants didn't pretend to agree when uh, they didn't really, as far as we could tell. But this time, something else really interesting happened. See, we asked participants uh, to make predictions uh, about how this conversation would go before they had the conversation. And then we asked them again after the conversation how it went. Uh, people generally predicted that this experience would be awful in lots of ways. They were really anxious about talking to someone from the diametrically opposite side of the political spectrum. But in fact, people reported enjoying the conversation and their conversation partner much more than they expected. And they found their conversation partner more logical and less emotional than expected. I think the significance of these results is really nicely summed up in this quote from one of our participants. This participant wrote, uh, the person was not who I was expecting. I pictured someone uh, more stereotypically conservative, bigoted, and likely to recite propagandized arguments. Admittedly, I prejudged the participant before I met them. I was pleasantly surprised to meet someone much different whose reasons for opposition were intelligent and founded in logic. The conversation did not convince me to change my opinion on the issue, but it did open me up to another perspective. Now, without our study, this person probably never would have had this kind of conversation and found out that they were wrong in their own assumptions. And this was a very common experience for our participants, according to their own responses that they gave us. Now, we are currently running the same kind of study using FNIRs. But to get conservative participants, we lent one of our FNIRs rigs to one of my former students, Ben Tabak, who's a professor at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas. And he is uh, recruiting the conservatives there while we recruit the liberals here. And then they have a conversation over Zoom while we collect FNIR scans of their brains. Um, we've just started collecting this data, so I'll have to get back to you on what we found, uh, but we're really excited about this project. And I just wanna end by thanking the amazing folks that were involved in this research. My graduate students, uh, Macrina Diefenbach, uh, who just finished her PhD, Ashley Benquist and Stephanie Dolbier, uh, who are continuing to do this work. And uh, Caleb uh, Kialoa was actually an undergraduate who did that romantic couples conflict study for his undergraduate honors thesis in psychology a couple of years ago. And he actually just found out last week that he was admitted to a PhD program at Harvard for next year. So he is off to very exciting things. Um, so that's it. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Professor Lieberman. Uh, Caleb is obviously following in your footsteps. And your, your research gives me is, is heartening in terms of getting people to talk actually is, uh, is, is something that, that decreases potentially their polarization. Um, actually, now I think we can bring everyone on if everybody would come back on because now we can get to the interesting discussion part that I'm, I'm excited about. Um, as you have conversations do, I mean, as you have questions, do put them in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, and I am going to go through the questions um, as many as we can get to. So um, let me first ask a question for all three of you, and then I have some specific questions for you uh, from, the, from the chat. Um, all of your work actually is quite heartening to me in terms of the, the promise of it for um, for mending um, some of the polarization, for, for having communication in people who are formally or minimally conscious, and for, and for uh, people who have struggled with addiction for often many years. So it's heartening. And, but all of your work is difficult. Um, it's it's um, exact, exacting. Sometimes it takes a long time. I, I'd love to learn from all of you, what inspires you to keep going? What's uh, what 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 keeps you what keeps you getting up and out of bed and and working on these difficult problems? Uh, maybe Professor Ray, do you want to start? Sure. Yeah. This is um, you know, it's it's interesting. I think I'm getting a lot more questions about substance abuse in light of COVID, and I think with COVID, um, we are more aware of our mental health or or challenges in mental health. I think 
with COVID and before COVID, just really um, being a part of someone's journey is very special. And I try to impart that on a lot of the trainees that I work with, is being a part of someone's recovery journey is a very special opportunity. And to see people recover and to see kind of what things look like on the other side is very exciting. For a lot of my patients, they say, you know, what we're seeing now is really the addiction talking. And I wanna hear Matt talking, I wanna hear Martin talking, you know, I wanna hear the real person. And I think that's the excitement uh, of helping someone through recovery is you really reconnect in a very powerful way. And then of course, all the things that they can do, right? They can be with their kids, they can be with their family, they can, you know, be members of uh, their community. So it's super exciting. It's a real privilege. Thanks. Matt, what, what, what keeps you going? Uh, I don't know. I guess uh, it, it's just sort of the way I'm wired. I'm, I'm obsessed with uh, understanding the social mind. And I think it's ridiculous that we get paid to do this. I'm really glad we get paid to do this, but you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I think I was shocked to learn that there was a profession. It's kind of like getting to be a professional athlete. It's like, I get paid to do the thing that I want to do anyway. So I just feel very lucky. I think the thing for me that has helped is that I've had the opportunity to kind of change what I focus on every four or five years in pretty dramatic ways. I've been lucky that I haven't been pigeonholed. And so then I can sort of take a new obsession with new graduate students. I know some of them are actually here uh, watching right now. And so we're getting to explore things that I can't talk about yet because we don't have the data yet that'll go in new directions. And so that's what I think tends to keep me going. And now in the later stages of my career, I think increasingly focusing on things that really matter in society feels like it connects me more to things kind of outside of academia. And, and that's been an increasingly positive part of what I do. Thank you. And Martin, what, what would you say keeps you inspired? Oh, definitely the money. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody who knows the salary of a professor, I mean, I feel that I'm being paid handsomely for, for doing the thing that I love, much like Matt is doing. <laughs> um, I have to say, a lot of the things that Matt said really resonate with me. I do have to admit that I also feel it's an incredible, when I, well, patient number two, the wife telling me, I spoke with my husband, you know, I had an interview. Oh, another thing that happens very often is we'll be doing these assessments after ultrasound and uh, and we always do them with family members there because because they see their loved ones all the time they know what they're capable of we only see them for sort of weeks at a time and suddenly that something will happen and i remember this happened during this past trial and the father just looked and said wow i had never seen that before and, and when the family tells me look this is new and these are patients who have been in this condition for a couple of years, so they're fairly stable. And then I think well, it's amazing. We've, you know, we're helping. We're moving the needle. That is is extremely, extremely rewarding. Uh, I have to say. And then, of course, pursuing these wonderful questions about understanding the mind is in itself, to me, very rewarding. Thank you. Um, now I want to ask uh, some questions from the audience that are directed to each of you, um, and so. Laura, how do people actually come to crave alcohol when at least at first it actually often tastes bitter and unpleasant? Yeah, well, it's interesting if you think about your last drink, um, I think you'd be hard pressed to remember the taste, right? <laughs> Oftentimes what people really remember, what's really salient is the experience and the enzyolytic effects, especially in times of high stress, alcohol works in the short term and it reduces a lot of stress and anxiety, as I said, in the short term. In the long run, it kind of makes it worse really. But um, I think that's really what people crave. They crave some respite. They crave an opportunity to escape some unpleasant emotions. That's what I hear from a lot of uh, folks. Thank you. And uh, uh, Dr. Monty, um, would this intervention potentially work with people with um, anoxic brain injury? That, that's a, a very good question. So there are different ways of ending up in a disorder of consciousness, the traumatic brain injuries, 
uh, but also non-traumatic brain injuries and anoxic. Um, the, sign, the answer I would give at a conf scientific conference is we don't really have the data to properly address that, but certainly in the data we have collected so far, we actually do see patients both in the anoxic category and in the traumatic category benefit from this, um, even if for now transiently. We still haven't worked out how many times should we do it and for how long and for, but I, I think the potential for benefit is there for both. We do see hints that it's there for both. And we're trying now a larger clinical trial to try to address these questions. Thank you. And by anoxia, that, that, that is, for example, if I'm a scuba diver and I come up and I don't have enough air, that's an anoxic brain injury? Yes, exactly, exactly. Typically, you know, being unable to breathe typically is what we lead. There are other things that can happen, but yes, near drowning is what we see most often. Okay, great. Um, and um, so for Dr. Lieberman, um, do you expect that the, what your, um, the, the kind of research you're doing with people with, with different ideological um, frames, would that apply also with children or adolescents, or is it something about you have to get to adult brain development in order to, in order to see the kinds of findings you are? Right. So, I mean, at this point, it has been largely tested with college age students, graduate uh, student uh, age folks. So, you know, folks from probably 18 to late 20s. There have also been some studies with younger adolescents in different domains. And in general, I think there is this common effect that has been seen which is, uh, you know, if two people are showing similar responses in this particular part of the brain, uh, as it fluctuates over time, they're going to report similar experiences of whatever was causing that activity. And this has actually been seen in some studies, not from my lab, looking at like parent and child and the extent to which the, you know, mother and child have the same responses in that region while watching something can predict that they will later talk about that thing in similar ways and so on. So while it hasn't been looked at with specifically uh, a focus on conflict uh, with lots of different ages, um, I think that in general, this idea that this region is kind of the brain's first pass effortless meaning making sort of system in the brain and that that is going to be something that tracks from a pretty young age. I don't know quite how young, but certainly by, you know, eight, nine, 10, I think you're, you're going to see meaningful stuff there. Okay. And I, I, I want to ask another question for you. And that is, um, what if you have two people and one of whom doesn't believe in science and the other believes in science should, or somebody's an anti-vaxxer and then the other person believes in vaccine, which in part is obviously connected to science. But, so are you suggesting that the kinds of processes you're finding really should work with any kind of disagreement or, or ideological difference? What I'm talking about will solve all problems ever discovered. No, it, um, no, I'm there kidding. You go. Me, so people in media always want us to make these grandiose claims. And I think we're at the beginning of this process. And, you know, the interventions that we look at in the scientific lab, we tend to look for, do they have measurable effects? Not do they like make a, a disagreement go away? And I don't think we're in the business of trying to make those uh, disagreements go away. I think our focus is on really on whether we can create more respectful, productive conversations where people can say, um, I understand that you have that position, not just because you know, you're crazy and foolish and unintelligent, but that there's probably some rationale to it. And um, uh, you, know, you can usually, if you sort of take the steps to understand where another person came to have that view, you can often come to appreciate why someone might hold that view if they were raised in that particular environment and were exposed to the information that that person was exposed to. And I think that that's kind of a first important step is not to sort of focus on why the other side is always wrong, but rather why we're quote so quick to sort of judge them as kind of being bad people for holding the views that they do. And, and I do it too, I'm not throwing stones here, but I think that's the first thing that we need to undo. And I think that if we can just get to a point, look, 
1950, people still disagreed, but they didn't seem to despise each other over their disagreements the way we do now. And I think that's the thing that we need to roll back to is not agreement, but a greater level of respect. Thank you. And um, Dr. Ray, um, this question is, is really about other factors that might be important. So when, when you talk about the, the drug uh, that reduces cravings for at least a subset, um, are other factors also important too? So for example, the amount of social support that the person had, and also can there be dr drug by drug interactions such as naltrexone? You know, if you're also, if, if you think about using naltrexone, are, are you using drugs in combination? So asking, I think both about psychological factors that are important and then also about other medications that might be. Sure. You know, when I'm treating patients, um, one of the things that, that's really important is to think about that one person and giving that person every possible chance to succeed. And that could be a combination pharmacotherapy that should definitely involve at least trying mutual health groups. There's good evidence for them. Um, I really don't want to hold back on anything that can give patients an opportunity to get better. And we've gotten a little bit more ambitious with some of our trials. One of our recent studies that, we, uh, that just got published looks at folks who can quit smoking and reduce drinking. And by doing that at the same time, I think we are improving quality of life. We are improving longevity, we are using combination pharmacotherapy, we're giving counseling. So yes, with these kinds of problems, when people can really gain 10 years of life expectancy if they quit smoking, we want to throw everything at them. We want to see that person living longer and happier. Thank you. Now, uh, Professor Monty, um, if, if a person um, in a minimal state of consciousness is not responsive the first time, do you have a protocol in place to try again? Or if they're not responsive at first, it, will they no longer be responsive um, to this kind of stimulation? Do we know yet? It's, uh, no, we don't. Um, we have learned that it's just, it, it's, it's hard to, it's at, time, at times hard to see these responses. It takes time, it takes practice. Um, so we haven't had the ability also because we started this about a year before, well, a couple of years before COVID, we got halted by COVID. Um, so we couldn't quite do as much as we wanted to do, um, but it's unclear. Um, I think one thing that we are likely to discover and it's part of our ongoing work is maybe there are some predictors of who can respond and who can't. Think of it this way, if, if the damage, um, if, if the cables that unite those very precious parts of the brain, the thalamus to the rest of your brain were broken, then I could stimulate that part of the brain as much as I want. I could stimulate the thalamus as much as I want. I could never restart it. I could never help it regain its you know, more function. So definitely, I think we're gonna find out these kind of findings, whether it might take multiple uh, times, we don't really know. So far, what we've seen is that when it works, we see it within, typically within 72 hours. That's the time frame that we're starting to see. Thank you. I actually cannot believe how tough, uh, how quickly the time has flown tonight. Um, we are actually out of time, and I I don't like that, but it's but it's true. Um, this conversation has been, uh, I think, fascinating. I can't wait to see the next set of studies that that all of you do, and we are going to send a post event email with the link to the recording of the webinar. So you'll be able to uh, take a look at the recording and please feel free to share it widely. Uh, we hope that you'll be able to join us for our next Psychology Presents. Um, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Lieberman, Professor Monty, Professor Ray. Uh, they truly are stars in their research and, uh, and it's such an honor to be in a department with them. Um, thank you all so much for, for joining us, and we hope to see you at the next one. Bye.